School district leaders are faced with a difficult problem. They have a responsibility to improve student learning, but they're not in classrooms with kids. What can someone sitting in a central office do that actually makes a difference? For the next hour, we will begin to explore that question. Welcome, my name is Karen Chenoweth, writer in residence at the Education Trust, a national organization that works to improve academic achievement for all children, but particularly poor children and children of color. One of Education Trust's reigning theories is that there are educators out there who understand how to do this work and that it's our responsibility to find them and learn from them. I've written two books and co-written a third exploring what we can learn from those schools and their leaders. And the big takeaway from all that work is that well-organized schools can help just about all students learn to high levels and that school leaders play an enormous role in whether schools are well organized or not. This is of course not new news. A substantial literature base exists to support the idea that school leaders are hugely important and here's where we have to give a nod to the Wallace Foundation which has supported much of that important research. Uh, by the way, we've posted links uh, both to EdTrust, the Wallace Foundation, and to other resources, and uh, please feel free to explore those. So, so we know schools and school leaders are important, but schools don't exist in a vacuum. They are part of school districts that are responsible for student achievement. Here again, we can rely on a solid base of research to understand the critical role that districts play, and I would recommend the Wallace Foundation's research, re report, Districts Matter, for a great rundown of the kinds of things districts can and should do. The question for us here at EdTrust is, are there district leaders who can help us see how the pieces fit together to improve student learning? We think the answer is yes, and we want to share what we've learned so far. Before I introduce my guest today, I want to, tell, I want to first acknowledge that today was, again, a terrible uh, tragedy at a high school in Pennsylvania and to say that our thoughts are with the families and the schools that are involved and uh, to sort of acknowledge that schools are very complicated places with lots of terrible things that go on in them but also really wonderful things and so we're going to focus on the wonderful right now. Um, but So I want to tell you a couple of things of, about why we are focused on past Christiane and why we think it's a district worth learning from. And the list, uh, in the list of resources on, uh, on your screen is a PowerPoint that will demonstrate some of those, uh, you know, that will have some of that data. But here are a couple of things to catch your attention. About two thirds of the students in past Christiane meet the qualifications for free and reduced meals. About one third are African American. And in Mississippi, about 69% of low-income students and African-American students graduate. In past Christiane, about 86% graduate, not just all students, but African-American students, low-income students. And um, we think that is something well worth studying. Its elementary schools are receiving recognition as being among the top elementary schools in the state. And the middle school principal was named Mississippi Principal of the Year. Uh, and was a finalist for National Principal of the Year for the National Association of Secondary School Principals. It is, in short, we think, a district on the move, and we think we have some of the right people right here to talk about that. We're going to have some more uh, coming, but right now we're gonna, I'm going to talk with Doc, uh, Beth John, Superintendent Beth John. She's at my left. Wave to the camera. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll be joined uh, uh, after a few minutes by the principals of the schools. Meredith Bang is prin principal of the high school, and Desiree uh, Lozana is principal of DeLille Elementary. Uh, today is a day that Mississippi State decided to audit the district of Pass Christiane, and they are uh, the, the principal of the middle school, Mr. Nelson right here, uh, and um, Dr. Kenitra Barnes are busy counting books and counting students for the auditors. They, we hope they will join us. Uh, this is life in real schools. Um, so right now, I want to welcome uh, Superintendent John and say thank you so much for kind of making this all happen. Thank you, and it's my privilege to be here. I'm honored to be part of this effort to help raise student achievement 
uh, for all students. So can you tell us a little bit about your background? How long have you been superintendent? What did you do before? Well, before I was superintendent, I was a first grade teacher. And then Mississippi opened the first public kindergarten in our district. And I thought, That's, that might be my calling. So I moved to kindergarten. And I have to be honest, the fact that that wing was going to be air conditioned may have played a little bit in my decision to move to kindergarten. But I stayed there for a number of years. And in kindergarten, I learned the importance of a great start for students. So that was a really vital part of what I do now, is understanding what happens in the lower grades. I moved from kindergarten to second and third grade and then made a big jump to seventh grade math at the middle school. And I found out a lot of my tricks that I used in kindergarten actually worked with the seventh graders too. So from math, I moved into administration as assistant principal and I stayed there until right after the storm when I moved as curriculum director. I stayed in curriculum and testing for five years and now I've been superintendent for two years. So you might say I grew up in this district. And for those of you who are not from the Gulf Coast, the storm means Hurricane Katrina, which pretty much devastated past Christiane in 2005. Um, talk, about, uh, talk about those years uh, of the storm. I, I, I think of them as years of the storm. Is that right? That's right. We, we date things pre-Katrina and post-Katrina. Uh, the day, the Saturday before Katrina hit in August of 2005, I was at a middle school. I was assistant principal there and we had just received a big shipment of paper. And you know how paper is so precious in schools. So we thought it was really, really important for us to protect the paper. So we gathered a bucket brigade of teachers and administrators and we put all the paper up on student desk. That was on Saturday. And then on Monday, uh, when Katrina hit, she totally destroyed the middle school. There was nothing left, let alone our paper. Nothing but bricks on the ground. Uh, the same with our elementary in town, Past Christian Elementary. Our high school had water uh, within inches of the second floor, so it was uninhabitable. Our elementary school in DeLille, which is about five miles inland, also sustained water damage, but some of that building was available for use. And so, uh, after six weeks, the district as a total moved into trailers on property that we owned in DeLille. Uh, all four schools together, we all ate lunch on the floor of the gym, we all shared the same portalettes, we uh, shared the muddy, rainy days. Uh, we were just very much a big part of one big team in DeLille. So, so in the middle of this, in the middle of sort of recovering from uh, Hurricane Katrina, you were, you, you faced an accreditation process. Is that right? We did. Yeah. We did. Once the mail started running, and I almost regretted that the mail started running because uh, we received a letter that it was time for our accreditation audit. Uh, district accreditation was an option at that time or accreditation by schools. And some of you may be familiar with the SACS CASI or the Advanced Ed Accreditation. Well, of course, we had no facilities. We had no uh, supplies. We had nothing whatsoever. And so we were able to postpone that for a few months. But it was uh, the thing, I believe, that kind of turned our district around. When we really started focusing on our accreditation, we decided that it was time to move together as a district, and this was a perfect opportunity. We had nothing left. Everything we had was donated. We were all together on one campus. So it was a great time for us to move as a district. And so we decided to be one of the first school districts in Mississippi to try for the district accreditation. Up until then, you had always gone for the school accreditation. Right. And, and so, so talk about, I mean, you thought it was a good time to come together as a district. Um, but I, I want you to talk just about why you did that. 
um, and what the ramifications were. But before you do that, I want to welcome Dr. Kanitra <laughs> Barnes, uh, who is not counting books anymore, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> and um, she is the principal, the fairly new principal of Past Christiane Elementary School. And Mr. Nelson, um, the uh, principal of Past Christiane Middle School. So welcome. Thank you for coming. Sorry, sorry you had to <laughs> rush from where you were, but I'm glad the auditors let you out. <laughs> Thank so. you for having us. Good afternoon. <laughs> Good afternoon. <laughs> so, um, so, so talk about, you, you give a lot of credit to this district accreditation. Mm -hmm. um, talk about the first steps that you had to take for that district accreditation, and maybe that'll help people see why you think that was a, a big step for the... Previously, a, a school accreditation time would come and that school would work furiously on their accreditation and um, the team would come in and, and honor them with a, a week-long visit and then they would be gone. And the other schools didn't really know what happened at that school. Uh, next year it would be someone else's turn. That was fine for moving a school forward, but it was time in our history for us to move forward as a district. And so it was important for us to get everyone on board. And the more I researched this process, the more I came to understand a district will not move forward unless all of its stakeholders move forward. That is the bus drivers, the cafeteria workers, the custodial staff, the secretaries, the teachers, the nurses, the parents, the, the uh, business leaders, community members. Everyone who has a stake in that school must be on the same page. It was a perfect time in our history to do that because we were totally regrouping anyway. 85% of our employees had lost their home, totally lost their home. Nothing, nothing left, maybe a slab was left. 95% of our city was gone. And so we really thought that we wouldn't exist anymore as a city or as a school district. It was important to prove the odds wrong. And so we gathered a team together a leadership team. It was comprised of the principals that we had. Um, at that time I was curriculum director, the business manager, cafeteria, uh, the maintenance supervisor, the transportation supervisor, and I was leading this effort. So I thought, let's get out of town so we can see something green. We went north a little bit and we went to a little cabin on a lake and I locked the door. And basically, that was, the uh, <laughs> that was the important thing. No one leaves until we've worked this out. And we took with us surveys that we had done. We'd sent out to all of our stakeholders. And those surveys uh, basically asked the question, what do you think are the most important things that this district should be about? What is the most important beliefs that we should hold for our students? And so we compiled all of those surveys. And from the surveys emerged five beliefs that continue to drive our district. And I'm sure you'll hear about those later on in the webinar. But from those five beliefs then came our vision of committed to excellence. Uh, it was many, many hours later that those three little words came out. But those three little words have driven everything we've done in this district. It was critical that we all believe that we're committed to excellence. It was critical that we live it and that we revisit it, that we monitor it, that we adjust. It, it's just a really, really critical part of the, our success in this district. I believe that was the turning point for us. So you and I actually didn't talk about this before, so I'm going to throw, throw this a little bit at you. But can you talk about where Past Christiane was academically, say, 15 years ago? Was it where it is now? I would say, first of all, 15 years ago, we didn't have the accreditation models that we do now. And so it was a little difficult to judge where you were in comparison with others in the United States. Um, our students competing on ACT was not such a big deal then. Our advanced placement classes were not that strong at that point. 
our middle school especially, if we had a scale of one to five, the middle school would have been on a three, I think. Um, and so we had room to grow. We definitely had uh, a need to improve. And when the new accreditation model came in with stricter standards, it really became apparent that we were going to have to ratchet up our game if, we are, if our students were going to compete with students across the United States. So you talk about how committed to excellence kind of drives just about all the, all the decisions in the district from how uh, secretaries set up their letters to all kinds of things. Can you talk about some of the decisions you make that where you've said, mm, it would be easier to do this, but darn it, we're committed to excellence, we'd better do that. It happens every day. And to quote Mrs. Bang, committed to mediocrity would have been a lot easier. But it permeates everything we do from, as you said, a, a letterhead that's a little bit crooked all the way down or up to the hiring of personnel for our district. It's really, really important. We've discovered this the hard way. It's really important for uh, people we interview for positions in our district, whatever position that is, whether it's a faculty member or as a part of our support staff, it's important for them to understand our vision, that we truly are committed to excellence. And with that vision, uh, a lot of your free time may be taken up. It requires uh, a lot of sacrifice on your part. It requires collaboration and working together. It requires uh, coming back and redoing something or revisiting a unit that you taught. So it's really, really important for uh, people to know that coming in. Uh, some have come in thinking that they were committed and unfortunately they decided this wasn't the place for them. And that's okay too. Now we know to warn them up front. <laughs> <laughs> so talk about the, the systems you've put in place to, to really kind of make that excellence uh, permeate through the district because you, you, you may say it in your initial interview, but how do you keep it going, monitoring and, and setting up those processes and procedures? We really have made a strong commitment to revisiting every year. And so every summer we go uh, as a team, the leadership team together, and we look at where were we last year. We look at all of our surveys that our teachers and our uh, faculty staff filled out. Uh, what are our areas of need? Where are we falling down? Um, and those are hard times because you always want to look at the positives. You want to be growing all the time. But growth is hard and growth has a lot of stumbling blocks along the way. And so it's important for us to build a culture where we're honest with each other. And when we get together in the summer and we look at our data, sometimes we're not happy with it and we have to regroup. We just make very, very sure that we have a focus for the new year. That happens every summer. And then as we come back, we make sure that our new employees are brought in with our vision, and then we revisit it all during the year. Whenever we are talking with groups, whether it's custodians or cafeteria workers or bus drivers, we bring that vision to the front. It's very, very important to keep it there because life happens and things get tossed to the side and you move on to the next great thing. It's really, really important to keep the main thing the main thing. And we work really, really hard to do that. So, um, so can, you clearly have a sense of urgency about this work, but you also seem to have patience with people's natural dislike of and distrust of change. How do you manage that? That's a tough, I mean, you just talked about it a little bit. You, you kind of look at surveys. Um, is there other, is there some other way that you, that you kind of manage through this like natural kind of, I, I think I'm doing a good job, I don't want to change? It's, it's very difficult. Um, and it's really, really important as a leader, a district leader or as school leaders to continually communicate with your staff. And to get to the point in communicating with your staff that they aren't telling you what they think you want to hear, but they have enough 
trust in you that they are telling you the truth about what's really going on or what their real needs are. And so we work very hard to make sure that that kind of culture continues in our district. Um, as I said, change is hard. And I believe if you decide that you're going to make a change and you stand on high and you make the edict that we will all now move in this direction, some will follow you out of fear. Some will follow you because they believe in what you're doing. Some will sit and not follow at all, and some will run the other direction. So I think I learned that the hard way. It's more important to me to build a small group that's ready for change. And you can find those. They, they seek you out. They come to you with ideas. Those are the people, I think, that you want to start with. And then that kind of energy starts to permeate others and it spreads and then some will go out the door still and that's okay too but I believe you bring more people along if you start with a core group that's ready for change. So we actually have some of the core group right <laughs> ready ready for <laughs> um, uh, so past Christiane has four schools and um, some people out there may think, well, that's a very small district, but in fact, about two thirds, I think roughly two thirds of the districts in the, in the country are this size or smaller. And um, many of the bigger districts kind of uh, organize down into this kind of a cluster system or, or pyramid system. So it actually, we think, has a lot of relevance for a lot of people. But can you talk, uh, I want, I, I want to start with Ms. Bang because she's been the, uh, a principal here in the district for the longest, I think. Mm -hmm. Isn't that right? Yes, ma'am. So uh, you began as an elementary school principal at Pass Christiana mm -hmm. Elementary. Um, that was your first principalship, right? At, at, yes, uh -huh, yes, that's correct. Yes. Well, actually, principalship was DeLille Elementary oh. first. Uh -huh. See, I didn't even know <laughs> that. All right, I'm sorry. Um, so if you can... Um, if you can I have my notes here. Mm -hmm. If you can talk about, this is, you're under a lot of pressure, mm -hmm. but it sounds like there may be support as well. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk about that kind of, um, and get us started, and then I'm going to kind of throw it open. I'm going to sit back here a little bit, <laughs> and I'm going to throw it open a little bit, because I think um, what Ms. John was just talking about is really profound, and you can maybe tell us if she's telling the truth or not. <laughs> You've got close your ears. <laughs> I would love to continue this conversation. I do feel privileged to have been a part of the Pass Christian School District for 16 years. And the opportunities that I've had began as a third grade teacher in the district at DeLille Elementary. Um, from there, I had the opportunity to lead as lead teacher and begin the growth through administration and then the DeLille Elementary principalship became open. And so that was approximately 13 years ago. Um, so it's great to see through the adventures Ms. John has um, spoken uh, to have been a part of that as well. Um, from there, I was able to lead Pass Christian Elementary School. I had just made a transfer there at the time of the storm. And then we all came back together there at DeLille Elementary as Ms. John described. Um, the adventures that we've had, as I said, truly have presented many challenging obstacles for us, yet I truly believe we've come to be stronger for those. Um, certainly, it takes more than the individuals that you see here before you. Um, we always come back to the team, and the reason is it takes a team. Individually, we're each just a ray of light, but when we come together, that's how we shine and we look for that collaboration within our schools there, within the departments within our schools. And we work our hardest to build those teams that are going to collaborate and work together to help us toward our mission of every student succeeding. And that does take a team. It takes whatever it takes. And then when, for example, as Ms. John mentioned about hiring those to um, be a part of that commitment to excellence, we're very frank in the beginning and during the interview process we'll share if you're willing to give your best and be your best and give 100%, that's probably not 
best for you to join us because it takes more than 100 <laughs> percent and and that's just the truth of the matter you mentioned pressure Ms. Chenoweth there's a lot of pressure there's here. a lot of pressure very honestly and the reason there's a great deal of pressure is because we take the work very seriously and the work is all-consuming yet the rewards are great challenges are great the rewards are greater and part of that comes from the support that we do have as an administrative team. We are each other's rocks, and we know that at the end of the day, we can always come to each other to help us work through anything that's providing us the greatest challenge for that day. And so through that, that's how we succeed. We are never satisfied with where we are. We don't ever feel like we've arrived. We share accolades with regard to success in one moment and present our, present our plans of improvement in the next breath. <laughs> we constantly consider ourselves to be in a plan of improvement because we always know that as things are evolving in education and changing that we can do better. And it isn't that we never make mistakes, of course. The erasers are worn down on our pencil, pencils as well. It's just that we work very hard to be sure that we don't make the same mistakes and that we're always better than what we were yesterday. And so um, with that, I give all credit to the team. Um, as Ms. John said, it extends beyond this because our transportation director is in on this with us and our food services director and our um, business manager, um, who not only does she speak financial lingo, she also speaks accreditation, she speaks accountability, she speaks textbook, she speaks everything involved with what we do every day. And that's important that our focus is laser driven towards student success regardless of the position you hold within the district. Would so, so can you talk about what, the, what student success looks like at your schools? Maybe start with you, Mr. Nelson. <laughs> student success. Um, I tell you, over the years, uh, how we look at student success has, been, has every year has been quite different. Uh, data drives every decision that we make. Uh, we're, we are a data-driven system. Um, uh, oh, yeah. We're Mr. examining. Nelson, you need to talk to that guy. Yes, <laughs> we're examining data daily uh, to make the, the best decisions for success. Um, uh, you know, data is driving the success, as Ms. John spoke of, uh, of us getting in the room in the summer, examining data to make decisions for the next school year. Uh, that's very important. It's very important that you include all stakeholders on in on. Uh, the decision-making process by using data. Um, that's so very important to us. what data do you look at? Um, what, what specific data are you looking at? Because um, schools are now drowning in data, right? Yeah, I mean, yes. so, yeah. so like you can, you can take a, you can, you can look at attendance data, you can look at suspension data, you can look at uh, I think we look at all of, rate all, data. Of <laughs> all of the above. All the above. All the above. Attendance, uh, you know, we, we actually go out and visit homes for attendance. You know, it's on any given day, we may come in and, and look at some data and go out to the house to see what's going on. Uh, we're looking at, uh, you know, the progress of students. Are we growing? Uh, we have those conversations with the parents, the students, as well as their teachers uh, as often as we can. Uh, when we're having parent meetings, we come to those meetings. Uh, when we're having those meetings, we bring data to those meetings to have meaningful discussion um, on the decisions that we're making or any changes that we have to make based on that. Uh, we have a ton of meetings. We have a ton of, we have a ton of parent meetings. I, I think if I can go back and track the meetings, those meeting turn, meetings turned into the hundreds during the year, uh, you know, with TST. Uh, uh, you'll have to explain what that is. Yes, uh, uh, it's our tier process. Every student in our school, uh, we consider as a tier one student. Uh, but when we, uh, we discover that we need to work a little bit more extensively on a skill, we will look at Tier 2 data, um, and then we will make changes based on that. We offer uh, comp, comp math class classes as well as uh, comp, comp English language arts classes to remediate some skills. Uh, we call that a part of Tier 2, and of course uh, we have three, Tier 3 in case we have to do some things a little bit more extensive. Uh, an hour a day of uh, remediation of, of skills and tracking data as well. And so and so this is part of the whole uh, response to intervention uh, system absolutely. that Pass Christian yes. has as yes. a whole. Mm -hmm. And can you talk about um, 
would you say data is the driver for you guys as well? Absolutely. Um, we are a district which embraces a Renaissance philosophy. And the Renaissance philosophy is one in which you celebrate students and teachers for everything positive that they're doing with regard to attendance, academics, and behavior. So with regard to success, it is not limited to um, performance on a state assessment. We look at students every week, every day. If it's nothing more than a high five or a shout out on our morning and announcements, we are constantly letting our students know that when you work hard, it truly does pay off. Through our teacher support team, every grading period, we are looking at data from our screeners that we administer throughout the school year, various computer programs that students um, have access to here at school and even at home. Um, we wholeheartedly embrace uh, literacy approaches and through Accelerated Reader we are constantly tracking how many of our students are reading books and showing success with regard to comprehending what they've read and so all throughout the year every day we are always finding ways to just lift student spirits. We recognize every, everyone won't be that honor roll student but growth is growth is growth and that's something that we're very excited about. Is that what you're looking at also growth? For me um, it is a combination mm -hmm. it is growth mm -hmm. but my data also consists of how my elementary students are doing in the middle school mm -hmm. setting. Mm -hmm. Are they leaders? Mm -hmm. Are they um, on the honor roll? Are they in clubs? You know it's the whole child. So I do look at the data we definitely look at the state assessments, but we're also looking at uh, behavior data. Mm -hmm. uh, how often are they being written up, but how many times are they having outbursts and, and tracking that data to see how we can improve all aspects and build leadership and success in our students. Because let's just acknowledge that this is a, a traumatized community. Mm -hmm. You all have students mm -hmm. who were in Hurricane Katrina, who lost family members, who lost uh, homes, and so forth. So, so this is not a community that um, has not had its challenges. All your children have had challenges. Mm -hmm. I mean, is that a fair thing to mm -hmm. say? Mm -hmm. That's very fair. Mm -hmm. um, when we we came back and gathered together back from the storm, what a day! What a day that was to see our children getting off the buses donated buses, I might add, <laughs> but just to see that they're safe and that they're alive because, of course, there was no communication still at that point, but to see them get out, it was just a glorious moment, but then when you started to hear their stories, because no one knew that the storm would be as bad as it was, it turned at the last minute, basically, and so people didn't leave like they normally would for a hurricane. And our students ended um, up on roofs and with holes in their attics, uh, with their heads sticking out, trying to give above the water. And when they came back to school, they were expected to grow and learn and, and get back to academics. And we really had to struggle with that. We, we had a lot of support, a lot of counseling that came in uh, that helped our students and our <coughs> teachers who had the same kind of tragedies. Um, so, yeah, it, it is a, a, it was a hurt community, but it really pulled us all together, too. And I think uh, it, good things came out of it. Well, and one of the things we've, we've been talking uh, in preparing for this webinar is about how you have, as a district, kind of, uh, and, and it seems that, um, <coughs> as the superintendent, your job is to kind of look out, see what's coming down the pike, and you saw Common Core coming down the pike quite a while ago, years ago, and started kind of getting everybody prepared for that. So you are now a fully Common Core implementing district. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about what that's been like, what that process has been like? Let's start with the elementary because you're building up, right? Uh, <laughs> um, because that a lot of districts are now kind of faced with oh gee mm -hmm. uh, we should have been doing something up and you know before now 
or they're really struggling with that process. Can you talk about how you, how you are um, sort of incorporating Common Core standards into what was kind of a functional, uh, well, <laughs> once it got after the storm, um, a district? Um, I think we made the shifts early, starting to um, give them a glimpse of what the standards are, unpacking the standards at an early, uh, in early in our career with Common Core, and then taking that a step forward each time, going in kindergarten and then growing that into first grade, and having that vertical alignment as well to unpack those standards and say, this is what it looks like. What are the verbs in those standards? What are the adjectives? What do we really need to hone in on and work on? And I think that it really helped that our district works together so well. We have PLCs together at the two elementary schools. So to be able to look at those standards together and decide what that's going to look like in the classroom and unpack those standards as a team, we presented those standards to the, the staff, um, helping them see that this was going to be a change, but it was going to be a step-by-step -step change, and we were all in it together, and we were going to take them step-by-step -step through that process. I think the implementation and phases made such a tremendous difference, not only for our faculty staff, but also for our parents. By beginning with kindergarten and phasing it into first grade and second grade, as well as with the upper grades, it really gave parents an opportunity to um, embrace the concept of having a much more rigorous curriculum um, implemented in our school and they really had an opportunity or we did as uh, as I should say of getting their buy-in because our children are involved in so many real world real life hands-on experiences here at school I can only imagine the conversations that must take place at the dinner table at night about the fun experiments they do in their science classes or the learning walks that they go on during their English language arts classes. So it really brings concepts to life and parents have really appreciated that. And it was really what was best for our children right. because they weren't um, thrown into it right. and um, afraid of that situation. They were gradually brought into it and it was just a, a better transition for them that they weren't stressed by Common Core and what was coming on board as well. So it, it hasn't been kind of this alien presence for, for, for your schools. Your teachers were able to kind of sit and unpack them. You have vertical alignment meetings. How often do, does that happen? We meet once a month, kindergarten through 12th grade, but prior to that at the elementary level when we began our implementation through our professional learning communities, we would still meet about once a month. And it's still a work in progress. When our teachers unpacked a few years ago, their interpretation has changed over the course of the past few years because they've truly had a chance to live it and breed the standards. And that's been interesting to just witness those conversations. What a teacher may have thought was the takeaway one or two years ago might be very, very different today. And I always find it funny to look in their binders, their curriculum binders, at the sticky notes because they love to put sticky notes on fun activities they may have created when they were pacing out um, for the year. And from month to month or year to year to see those sticky notes change is very refreshing the growth there so you so so teachers meet during the summer to unpack standards mm -hmm. and kind of develop a pacing guide but then once a month mm -hmm. you have teachers meeting um, through the uh, to, to vertically align mm -hmm. through the, the district and through our schools mm -hmm. we have in our in our individual schools we have grade level mm -hmm. meetings and then we also have departmental meetings that are K through 5 and then once a month we have K through 12 so that it all comes together. So this is a very carefully s structured kind of process. Um, can you talk about how Common Core has been uh, working in the middle school? Middle schools are tough. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, uh, uh, I'm thankful for elementary. Uh, uh, you know, for two or three years, uh, the, the principals and the staff in, um, in elementary um, they uh, work very hard with kindergarten, first grade, and second grade to uh, to 
uh, create that shift. It, it's been a huge instructional shift for, shift for us. Um, some things we felt like we were closely in line. Some things uh, based on the instructional shift, uh, we, feel, we felt as if we, we had some work to, to, to go and can, to can do. Can you talk about maybe something you had to give up? Like, was there something <laughs> teachers had to give up that they, that yeah. they really didn't want to give up? Well, from an instructional standpoint, we, I think uh, we figured out uh, some of the things uh, as far as achievement. Some of the areas that we felt that we need to work on and improve, uh, we thought that we were there <laughs> uh, based on our results. And, and uh, based on Common Core, it's a huge shift. Uh, for example, uh, students in uh, eighth grade took Algebra one or are taking Algebra one in middle school uh, that instructional shift goes back to high school. Uh, that wasn't a very comfortable feeling from a principal standpoint uh, because, um, you know, your successful schools here in our state and, and across the nation, uh, we're looking at the research or the, some of the things that they're doing to be successful. And uh, that's something that we were had to refocus and uh, be comfortable with the change. Uh, we also had some instructional shifts in the English language arts. Uh, we were examining uh, even what they were doing in elementary school with the elementary principals. Uh, we decided to look at some of the assessments together, Mrs. John and I and our staff and leadership team, we sat down to uh, look at our assessments to really closely look and see how aligned uh, the verb is that's being used, what we're asking students to do to accomplish. Uh, this year has been a huge uh, shift again uh, for even sixth grade. Um, sixth grade mathematics is not wouldn't, wouldn't you say general math any longer? Uh, students in sixth grade now are taking some pre-algebra kind of things, maybe some algebra as well as geometry kind of things. Uh, that's brand new to us. And so we, we feel very comfortable uh, if we get through this school year uh, and uh, with some of the new things that are coming for our state and our school, uh, we'll, we will closely work hard to align everything that we need to align to be successful with the Common Core. And maybe you can talk a little bit at the high school level, um, and maybe you can describe a little bit what uh, your high school teachers are doing to implement Common Core, because we haven't talked about that yet. Okay, certainly. Um, a shift has been, um, and, and I'll share, I feel like it's a lot like walking a tightrope, <laughs> because we are still accountable to our subject area testing exams. Those are graduation requirements in our state and that isn't changing at this time. And yet we've embraced the new curriculum as well through Common Core, and so how we've approached that is realizing that every teacher is a reading teacher, for one, and we all need to focus more on the reading and the writing, and writing about that which we read, the close, close reading. And also through the vertical alignment, we have grown as a district because we've realized that there was repetition from grade to grade within some novels that were being read, not all books were on level for what the children were, were actually capable of reading and meeting those goals. And so alignment-wise, that's something specific that has helped us throughout the grades. Also with regard to common vocabulary, we do have those conversations beginning with kindergarten. We speak about the scientific process. The high school teachers are able to share, if you'll use the word hypothesis from the beginning, and then it's like, well, that's easy. We can do that. Those students are ready for that in kindergarten. And we work that through the elementaries, through the middle school, and then to the high school. So certainly everyone is embracing it. Um, the shift going to not only what we're thinking about, but how we're thinking about those things, and then writing about our thinking. Um, that's critical. And that's really embraced as far as the career um, inside of this, that's embraced by that because that's the real world. Being able to read those technical manuals and being able to write and follow directions. So through Common Core, I know that our students are gaining even a greater ability to join the college and career um, worlds in which they will. And I also believe that the shift that has happened for professional development has been great for this as well because we've realized that the experts are right within our school district 
and how wonderful that is. So a great deal of the teaching has come from Ms. John's leadership and then building capacity through excellent teachers already on our staff, leading the other excellent teachers that we have there. So we've built in Common Core facilitators and that's been a great help for us kindergarten through 12th grade to reach our goals of Common Core implementation as well. So Ms. John, maybe you can talk about how that kind of came to be because a lot of districts, I think, are um, uh, doing kind of what you would might have done if you had had more money. Mm -hmm. You might have kind of hired more consultants, hired companies to come in and train the staff, and you didn't have the money. So uh, this is not an argument for less money. Uh, <laughs> Pastor Christiane should be getting more money, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> We but would like to say that louder. <laughs> <laughs> say it louder. And need more money. But but you you didn't have it, and yet you need, knew you needed to uh, move to Common Core standards. This was a big shift. And how did how did you think about uh, you know what you were going to do to to meet that need? It. I guess it came about because we we are in a financial crisis. Our state is underfunded education again this year. Our federal funds are dwindling. Our local uh, has had to pick up more and more of our funding. So it became very, very apparent to me when I became superintendent that if we didn't make some huge changes that we were going to have to lose some teachers. And so as, uh, as I looked at that situation, um, I began to look at, okay, when central services, which is our central office, when someone retires there, then because we are committed to excellence, someone else will just pick up that work on top of theirs. And so we're very, very small at the top in central services. And we do everything we can to funnel that money down to the schools so that we can keep teachers in the classrooms and keep our class sizes small. So in thinking about that, well, I knew we didn't have money for consultants to come in anymore. And I looked for the high flyers. I looked for uh, teachers that had come to me and said, hey, do you know this is going on? We could do this with Common Core. And here's a great book I've been reading. And those high flyers just emerge. If you watch for those, if you're out and about in your schools and you, you have, are open, and listen for those, you'll find the leaders in your school. And so I found three, three of the best. One is a math leader, one is a language arts leader, and one is for special education. And you'll have an opportunity to see them later on. Those three then uh, worked with me. And, and I, as an aside here, I think it's really important for superintendents to understand the curriculum those days of just being the manager of the district are over. If a superintendent does not understand what they're asking their faculties and their administrators to do, then I don't think that superintendent in that school district will make as much progress as when the superintendent thoroughly understands the task at hand. And so we sat and we mapped out a plan. Uh, we did a lot of summer training with our K-12 all in one room. It was a delicious moment to see high school teachers going over to elementary teachers and helping them understand this new, uh, more complicated math that they had to teach. But the most delicious moment was at the end of that when the high school teacher said to the elementary, now you help me understand learning centers because I need to differentiate my classroom and I don't know how to do that. So that was a great, great day. I wish I could just capture that moment in a picture. Uh, but it, it was a signal that we were moving in the right direction. And so throughout the year, these three people uh, have a period off or a block period off a day, and they go from school to school, and they work with teachers. Their support, basically. They help them find the materials that they need. Sometimes they move them when the teachers aren't quite ready to move. They help them with their lesson planning, with their unit planning. They take us to the next step in Common Core. It has been a fabulous, dare I say, cheap solution <laughs> <laughs> to a huge, huge problem. 
But I believe that that really was key for us too, because sometimes when consultants come in from the outside, they don't have our standards. They don't have our drive and our commitment. And we let a lot of consultants go back out the door because they weren't making us grow. If consultants weren't making us uncomfortable and making us reach, they really weren't for this district. And so it really has worked out well to have people who are in the district making us grow and making us uncomfortable and, and helping us to, to move forward to the next step. Well, and I, I did some interviews with the three Common Core implementing teachers and that they will be edited and over the course of the next couple of weeks will be posted on YouTube, I hope. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, so, and I think you'll be able to see exactly what um, Ms. John is talking about, about implementing Common Core. Um, we do have a question from the audience, and that is how you, what assessments do you use to track growth? Because you've talked a lot about growth. How do you measure growth? You, you start, do you use, say, Dibbles, or do you use DRA, or what, what are you using? We use, um, we have Classworks that we use as benchmark. We have the Star Renaissance that we're using, our uh, state assessments. And another thing that we did really well during the summer was to create our own common term assessments, which we will need to do with the park mm -hmm. assessment that really gave us a lot of feedback as well. Mm -hmm. so those are some of the ones that we use. I'm sure, I'm sure, there, I, I'm sure that's just a partial <laughs> list. Yes. What about, um, what, what are you looking at at the secondary level for, to measure growth? I know in middle school we use uh, Classworks as well. Um, we use, we've used their university screener as well as the uh, benchmark. Um, we use it in other classes with a tier process uh, to track if we're growing students. Um, you know, that process is very, is very important to us because uh, we're looking at that data uh, weekly uh, and we're graphing the results of that, that data uh, based on progress monitoring. Um, we do use Classworks with our tier process as well. Uh, with Curriculum Advantage. There are several programs there uh, that are different that we could use to differentiate and, and, and grow and remediate some skills. And so uh, that program is very important to us in all of our grades. Um, in sixth grade, uh, we actually uh, use Classworks as an elective to, uh, to track students in, in mathematics as well as English language arts. Uh, and we progress monitor that as well. I might, if I might jump in, uh, we aren't as picky about our computer programs as we are about consultants. Mm -hmm. uh, they really have to meet our standard and we, very, we monitor that very, very closely. And so because of our budget, we have very, very few quote unquote computer programs. We, we find something that works and we stick with it. And the important part is to implement it with fidelity. And so we make sure that we're getting bang for our buck, that we're following the protocol set by that company. But you won't find a plethora of programs in our district. Uh, even if we could afford it, I don't think that we would do that because we really are very, very choosy about uh, what we use to monitor our children. The best monitoring that we've done has come from our own work, uh, writing assessments that match the rigor of the assessments that our students will be challenged on. Those are the ones that provide the richest data for us. It takes a lot of time and a lot of tears, but those are the most, um, I think, the most telling for our students. So, so one of the, we're about to wrap up. One of the questions I'm, I'm curious about, Ms. John, is this is a relatively small district. Do you think that you have lessons for larger districts? Is this, is, should districts sort of say, oh, well, they can do all that because they're small? I've, I've thought about that a lot. Um, we have had larger districts who visit us and they, sometimes they say, well, y'all are small. We can't, we can't replicate that in our district. But as I think about that, I think a large district is just a lot of small districts in one. So break your district apart. Find the high flyers in each section of your district. 
find someone in maintenance who's passionate about children. They don't have to understand the curriculum, they just have to have the passion to grow children. Find someone who's in your cafeteria, who's passionate about growing kids. Start with those people. Start to train a business manager, if you have more than one. Uh, teach them about curriculum. Teach them about what's important. And start to just build capacity with each of the players in your district. Break it apart into small clusters. And I really think you can replicate what goes on here. But I, I hope what you gathered is the main thing that drives us is the teamwork, is the collaboration, is the coming together. If we operate in isolation as a school or even as a central office, we don't accomplish what our goal is. And our goal is growing children, growing them and having them compete in the real world, whatever their profession or their college career whatever that goal is for them. It's super important though to be of one mind, of the, the center of what you do must be student learning and it's, it's a process of growing people to understand that too. And I think large or small districts can do that. So, uh, so we're going to wrap this up and I think this has been a great conversation. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, part of what's really fascinating to me about talking with educators all around the country is how individual each context is. No one else is quite like past Christiane, whether it's size, it's demographics, it's geography, it's history, including its devastation in Hurricane Katrina. And that's part of the unique context of the past. But what, I hope that's okay that I call it the past. <laughs> that's kind of the nickname. Um, but what's more interesting to me is that what they have to share could be replicated by any district anywhere. It begins with a commitment to wanting their students to be able to be successful wherever they are, whether they stay local or go global, um, and uh, to understand what excellence looks like. And th that has kind of driven them to it's driven this district to embrace common core state, state standards, which means their students will be able to measure themselves against students around the country and the world. They've established practices and procedures that require the adults in the system to communicate with each other regularly. So the principals know what the other principals are doing. I think you heard that. Teachers know what other teachers are doing. All this is really well documented in the research di literature, such as the Wallace Foundation supported Districts Matter. But it's important to see how that plays out with actual human beings, I think. And in our next webinar, we're going to be exploring some of the same themes in a, in a somewhat larger district, Indian River School District in Delaware, Indian River School. Uh, population has grown dramatically in the last decade or so, with most of the growth coming from uh, students who live in poverty with uh, 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 families that don't speak English at home. So that's another kind of context. And we're going to hear from Superintendent Dr. Susan Bunting and some former and current principals. So plan on joining us May 1st at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. If you can't make it, we'll be posting the recording as we will. Uh, today's webinar and I want to thank everyone um, uh, this so today's webinar will be available as an both a podcastable audio recording on the Webex uh, site but we will also be recording uh, we're also taping this and we'll be posting it um, on YouTube as well so um, plan on coming back uh, and telling your colleagues about it and, and sharing this as a resource. Uh, we're hoping to schedule at some point a Google Hangout to kind of process some of the information that we're finding out in the webinars. And I want to thank everybody here at Pass Christiane for sh generously, generously sharing your time and thoughts. And thank you to all the webinar participants. Please fill out the survey that's going to pop up on your uh, web, uh, on your computer. That's how we know whether we're kind of hitting the mark with these webinars. So thank you so much. Thank you very much and come back on May 1st. Thank you for having thank us. You. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs> All right. Thank you ladies and gentlemen for your time and attention today. That does conclude our presentation and you may disconnect.